Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, frequent flyers. Thank you for joining Kim, Casey, Campbell, and I. Today we are talking about leading with courage. And as Plato so aptly put, courage is knowing what not to fear. We're going to dive into leading through the face of fear and having practical decision-making insights, how sometimes our personal and professional lives are diametrically opposed in terms of our goals and how we feel about them, and using stress to really build our resilience and grow from and through these experiences. Kim is a retired Air Force colonel who served in the Air Force for 24 years as a fighter pilot and senior military leader. She and I have many mutual friends in this space. We were just talking before we got on the show about aviation and the power of being able to connect in our industry. Kim, I am so excited to have you on the show. Thank you for being here today. I'm excited to be here as well. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Me too. And we also had some, some guests joining um, even earlier than the live start putting in some comments. So for everyone that's watching, if you're here with us live, please do feel free to comment throughout the show and ask questions. And we'll make sure we address those before we sign off for today. So Kim, I know that you've written a book and you know, you're know you really, really passionate about leading with courage and, and facing fear head on. Can you tell me a little bit about how that came to be the title of your book, you know, um, Flying in the Face of Fear and why this is so important to you? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I was actually really hesitant to use the word fear in the title mm. of my book. Um, and in fact, I've got some feedback that maybe I shouldn't use it. And I thought, you know, that's exactly why I should is because sometimes we're afraid to talk about fear. We feel nervous or worried when we talk about fear. And as I look back at my career, you know, just recently retiring from the military, I've had some time to reflect. And I realized that there were so many times throughout my career at the just various stages that I felt fear or nerves or worry about what I was going to do, whether it was starting basic training at the Air Force Academy, whether it was walking into my very first squ uh, fighter squadron, knowing I was going to be the only female, or later in my career, being a commander for the first time and leading people. And even as a military spouse, when my husband deployed, I mean, in those moments, there was fear, there was worry, there was doubt. And mm. I, what I realized is that it's all about what you do in those moments. Like fear is a very normal reaction. It is all about taking that next step, you know, walking in the door, walking up the ramp for basic training. It's just taking that next step, being afraid and doing it anyway. And so that's kind of the, I guess that's where the idea for the title for the book came in. And yeah. I really just felt like we do face fear. It is all about what you do in that moment. And as a leader specifically, there are so many times where you doubt maybe a decision or you feel worry about that tough conversation that you're going to have. And it is, again, it's putting in the work, being prepared, being ready so that you can take action in those moments. And, and so that's the idea uh, behind leading with courage, because it does take courage to do the hard things in leadership. It does. And, you know, what you just said there about being ready reminds me of a, a quote that I, I used the other day from Will Smith, which is, if you're always ready, then you never have to get ready. That's right? good. And, I like it. I thought it was, yeah, it just, you just uh, re reminded me of that. And, you know, sometimes those hard things we, we worry, you know, maybe we've never done it before, right? We, we, we don't have maybe the expertise or the skill set where we don't feel confident using it, but the only way to gain that confidence is through the practice through doing it. And I love the um, being afraid and doing it anyway. Right, because we can ride that edge of excitement, and we can and look at it from a different perspective. And I, I saw this um, video of a roller coaster yesterday, and the caption was, "Would you ride this?" And it was doing all sorts of things, <laughs> and it also just looked quite terrifying. But there was also that piece of me that was, "But wouldn't it be fun?" I'd be terrified, but I would also have fun. Maybe now I'd also have neck pain because I'm not 12 <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but um, what has that line been like for you between, you know, exhilaration and then the, maybe the fear, that terrifying edge? You know, ha have you found that there are two sides of the same thing? And how do you flip between those perspectives? Yeah, I feel like there's so many times where I have felt really excited about something, but also nervous. Yeah. And I think when I do those things anyway, whether it's riding a roller coaster, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good with roller coasters. It would be like a uh, bungee jumping or something like that. Pretty right. exciting, but also terrifying. Yeah. Um, when I think about those things, you know, 
what for me, I realized that if I don't do it, right, like, what do I miss out on? What are those opportunities that I miss out on if I don't take that leap of faith, which is a good analogy with the bungee jumping. But I think, you know, just even opportunities in our life and in our career, um, where you can be excited, but there's still that maybe little sense of inner doubt or, or nerves that go with it. And I think about what's on the other side of that? Like what opportunities am I going to miss? And I'll tell you, I was very, very nervous about publishing my book. I just, I I felt passionate about it. I was excited about it to share the message, but there was also this part of me that was like, this feels very vulnerable. Like this Uh feels like I'm putting it all out there for everybody to see. And I know not everybody's going to like it, but secretly you do want everybody to like it. (laughs) It's a human thing that we want to do. It's just, I think now, like if I hadn't done that, like all the people that I've been able to connect with and that have reached out and just the small little differences that, you know, I've made in people's lives, like I would have missed out on that. They would have missed out on that. And I think it's just, sometimes you have to take that leap of faith, even when it feels really uncomfortable. Absolutely. And, you know, to that point as well, sometimes we don't know who we're impacting, right? We were talking a little bit about that uh, before we went live and that's okay. We don't always need to know all of the lives we've touched or impacted. And at the same time, when you finally do get to see that, it makes it all worthwhile. And so what I'm hearing is that it's really important to have a practice that allows you to feel that that self-trust, that that confidence in yourself and that belief that even if this person doesn't like me, I'm okay because I like me. Yeah. And I think, you know, I look back to my days flying the A-10 and my our primary mission was close air support. And so I knew that we were making a difference for the troops on the ground. Like I, I just, I understood that in general. Yeah. But those moments where somebody sent me a note or came back by the op center to talk to me, like, that all of a sudden was like, wow, this is exactly why I do what I do because of these people and because of this impact. Even if you don't know it specifically all the time, it makes a difference. But something else that you touched on is that preparation going into it. And sometimes when you hear that reminder, when someone says, hey, something you said or something you did connected or stuck with me or made a difference in my life, it's a little bit of a reminder to me of the responsibility to be ready, right? So that yeah. you don't have to get ready. It's that, <laughs> you know, you're you're prepared, you're ready for that moment, no matter when it comes or what it is, you put in the work, you practice, you plan for contingencies, you just, you do all those hard things so that in that moment, you're ready. And that way you can best support, in my case, as an A-10 pilot, that I was ready for those moments supporting troops right. on the ground. Um, But that preparation is critical. And for me, it's been like the driving force throughout my career. It also has helped me face those fears and face those doubts by putting in the work. Um, Because it just, for me, when I start feeling those nerves, it usually means I haven't put in enough work. Uh, And so it's a reminder to get back into it. I love that. So you're using, instead of getting lost in the emotion and letting it overwhelm you, you're using it as information that helps you make a better decision. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I think in the day to day life, we are so busy. And this is something that we often do for self preservation, right? If we're busy, we don't have to face those feelings of nervousness, of anxiety, of, you know, oh, am I doing this the correct way? And yet, once we can pivot and look at it from that other perspective of this is just information. And if it makes me uncomfortable, that's that's a good indicator that I sh- I could move over there and get rid of this discomfort and also be in a better position for better decision making. And that goes for personal and professional life. You know, when we when we feel those feelings of discomfort instead of trying to hide from them, we can use them to, as you said, you know, build that build that resilience. And in those small little moments, they will they will add up. So when the big moment comes, you can default to that training. Yes, very well said. I think it's that I, for me, like I'll just like I'll be up at night. And I'm like, why? Why am I thinking about this? Or I'll just it's something pop, you know, popping in my head constantly. And I'm like, why do I keep thinking about this? What am I so worried about? And so for me, I've learned I just need to acknowledge it. You know, I just need to mm-hmm. go. Okay, 
I'm clearly worried about this, or there's something that's not quite settled. So let me take the time to just acknowledge it. And then, okay, let's, let's dig in now. What am I, am I not prepared enough? Am I worried about the conversation? What can I do to kind of either, I believe in visualization, it stems from chair flying as in my early days as a pilot, but I, I'll just walk myself through it and kind of acknowledge what I'm worried about with it. And then, you know, maybe I need to study a little bit more and maybe I need to do a little bit more research on something, or maybe I need to practice a little bit more. Um, yeah. and, and I'm also a big believer like, okay, let's think through the worst case scenarios here. Like, yeah. what am I so worried about? Like, let me think about those things. And then I'm like, okay, now I've got a plan to deal with them. I know what I'm gonna do if that happens. Now I need to let it go uh, yes. and move forward. I love that. And I'm a big proponent of visualization as well. I was a competitive athlete growing up. And that is something that you do before competition. You know, you you see yourself nailing the jump, hitting that ball, throwing the pass. And that is what is allowing you to do it. And, you know, there's always, you know, people talk about the adrenaline that you get when you're on that show floor. So whether you're speaking, whether you're leading a team, uh, whether you're about to take off and you're doing your pre-flight briefing, all of those same things are happening. And so, you know, our brains are real fascinating. And even though it's not physically happening, if in our mind we are visualizing it, that is a version of reality that our body is now experiencing. And so all of the same hormones can start to go off and those same feelings. So we can start to invite those in and then being prepared to face any potential downsides is how you know that you are capable to be able to get through that when it comes And I recently, um, last year, was introduced to doing it on the flip side because we still don't like not knowing. We fear the unknown. So if we are now prepared for worst case scenario, what about best case scenario? What if it goes so well that you sell out and or you've oversold and now, you know, you have 200 extra seats you need to fill or, you know, it goes the complete opposite direction. We often don't stop to consider those scenarios but at the same token, likely they're as ridiculous as the very worst case possible. And in the same token, we can start to prepare ourselves for what might happen. Because imagine that, you know, best case scenario happens, you might be going, well, I, I did not expect this and I'm totally unprepared, <laughs> even though so it's a true. wonderful thing. Yeah, that's so true. That's such a great way to look at it. It's the, yeah, you, I mean, ideally you can kind of think through that best case and you'd love to happen and, and you're prepared for no matter what happens. Yeah. Um, I, I look at that. It also in terms of like a debrief after an event, yeah. I love to like, we, and especially with fighter pilots, like everybody assumes we just drill down into the mistakes, which we do. But I also think it's really important in a debrief when you're doing, or an after action report or a team huddle, whatever it is, that you talk about the things that went really well, because ideally you want to repeat them again. And so yeah. focusing on the good is as important, equally important as, you know, focusing on the mistakes and learning how to learn from those and do it better the next time. Absolutely. And I love that you brought up the concept of the debrief because a lot of people are where there's a pre-flight checklist, right? And there's a series of steps that you go through, but that debrief after, no matter if the mission was a success or not, is so important because if you had a mistake, you want to uncover what led to that mistake so you don't repeat it. But if you were successful, you also want to know how to keep doing more of the same. Yes. You know, otherwise, you're throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping that something sticks. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, and sometimes we get so busy and caught up and just moving on to the next thing that we don't spend the time to debrief. But as you said, like, and you'll find this a lot when you're successful, right? Because you're like, oh, good, done, move to the next one. But what made you successful? You know, really like, what were those key moments that really connected with people? Or, you know, what are those key things that you did to cause that success? I think it's just as important. Absolutely. Well, and the woman that I co-presented with Renee Bengelstor last week at base, one of her favorite questions to ask is what about my leadership led to these results? Because whether those results are positive or negative, that is taking the ownership of the the behaviors and patterns and actions that you as the leader had. And it will also help you to uncover, well, maybe I didn't clarify the the request after I, I made it and I had an assumption that there was understanding, right? And so there's there's a lot of micro moments that when we are aware and we are checking in, tuning into the right frequency, we're able to capture. And then again, that just builds up your own personal 
um, foundation so that when it comes to those harder decisions, it's a lot easier because the muscle exists already. Isn't that so true though? Because I think we tend to spend the time thinking about the things we did wrong, right? We, right. Ooh, how could I have done that better? But the question is, what did I do that caused the success here? You know, it's, it's yeah. helping you also focus on the things that you did well. We tend to be, or at least I do tend to be pretty hard on myself and there could be 99 things that go right. But that one little thing that <laughs> goes wrong thing. is really where I am going to give myself a hard time on. But would I ever do that with my team? No. So why do I do that with myself? Absolutely. And we've got some people saying good morning um, from Seattle, from Nebraska. Thank you for joining us. Um, I don't think you're alone in that. I think that there are many people and, it, and we're designed that way. We are we are designed so that we can avoid danger. We can survive and, you know, not eat those poisonous berries again or, oh, that's where the saber tooth tiger lives. And so it's, it's our reticular activating system at work. And so when we focus on those successes, those best case scenarios, the things that we can do to repeat positive outcomes will invite more of the same because we'll begin to recognize like, oh, this is happening again. I can now do this and have that result rather than being oblivious to it and maybe missing that opportunity. You know, there's, there's many times where if I reflect, I think like, man, there was probably somebody like waving red flags, like, Hey, over here. And I was so tunnel visioned on this direction and that, you know, I had to get over there that I completely missed it. But if I would have taken a, just a pause to, Hey, what are my surroundings? What? Oh, whoa, look at that. Maybe, maybe that's some information I'd like over there. Yes. Very true. <laughs> so, you know, when we talk about preparedness, you know, what are some things that you know, as you have gone through the preparedness, obviously in, in a flight briefing session, that's that's what we have to do. But in your personal life, how have you taken that and translated that into the day to day activities? Well, I think for me, I you know, there is the get in the books approach. You know, do your research about something. Um, for me now, as a speaker, my you know, my research is a lot about looking into different companies and what their values are and connecting with people and mm -hmm. really learning about them. Um, but I also, like I said, I believe in practice. I believe in visualization. So for me now, again, I'm, you know, I will rehearse, but I also do a lot of visualization. Um, and then I do a little bit of planning for contingencies and thinking about those scenarios. And I, I feel like I learned those techniques in aviation. You know, I started out, you know, as a pilot, being in the books and studying and then chair yes. flying. So thinking about being in the cockpit and visualizing it, practicing radio calls, and also thinking about those contingencies, the emergencies or what things could go wrong. And I just found that that translates now. So, you know, that's how I use it now. But I think even as a leader later in my career, um, as a as a military officer, I realized in leadership, it was very applicable as well. I mean, it, it's everything from do you have to make a, a difficult decision? You know, there's something going on, you have to make that decision. Well, do the research, right? Do your homework, <laughs> prepare by finding out, you know, are there after action reports? Are those those things in, you know, that have what's been what's worked in the past? What hasn't? Yeah. Um, and I still believe in the practice and the chair fly and the visualization. I think you can do that as a team. It's a, a team huddle. It's a walkthrough potentially of the d day's events or a, a tough presentation or a negotiation, whatever it is, you can actually practice. You can chair fly, you yeah. can visualize. Um, and then, like you said, uh, you know, you take the time to think about those things that could go wrong, but I love it. I'm also going to think about the things that could go really well. And are we yes. ready for those? Yes. Amazing. And I, I love that you just brought up that walkthrough um, practice because I think some in, in the, the business setting and particularly in corporate aviation, things are moving so fast and they're changing constantly. And yet if you can do like a verbal walkthrough with your colleague of that day's fly, aircraft that are flying and just, you know, two eyes looking at something, sometimes you stare at that you know, screen or that piece of paper, and you will miss. Our brains omit repetition. They also will fill in information when there's a gap. So you might be missing something because you've been in it for so long. Getting that other person to be on that walkthrough with you is going to help you catch some of those small mistakes that could add up and lead to, you know, a, a permit not being granted or a miscommunication of some kind and, and something going wrong. Yeah. And even if it takes just do a quick five minute huddle, 
you know, yeah. before you walk in the door, before you step to fly, whatever it is, you know, just if you don't have the time, and this is what I hear from leaders a lot, uh, yeah. is we don't have the time to do that long briefing or debriefing. I'm like, well, okay, ideally you make the time, but you know what, F a five minute huddle to talk about some of the, maybe the risks or the tough things that we might face, just that quick sink, it's better than nothing. Absolutely. And once you carve out that time, even if it's five minutes, I find that it becomes way easier for that to be elongated. And then you begin to realize the benefits. And so it it's not a barrier anymore to have it. And now you, you know, you're in the flow. And then that might extend to 10 minutes. When it's necessary, it can go longer. When it's not, it can be very short. But it's just that quick little tune in. Are we on the right frequency? Yeah. And you know, recognizing the value of it, really seeing how it, it can lead to more success or a better mission, whatever it is, um, yeah. because there's value in that. And, and then it's worth taking the time to do it. Absolutely. Because I also hear from leaders, oh, I was just really lucky that I pulled it off, right? Especially the aviation environment is highly regulated. And when you have a constantly changing environment, sometimes we're, we're creating something from what seems like nothing, or we are, you know, solving a problem in the 11th hour. And man, does that feel good, right? A lot of adrenaline, a lot of dopamine. And yet at the same time, that that wasn't just sheer luck. There was preparation. And so one of my favorite quotes by Seneca, I'll just pop it up. Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And so what I'm hearing from you is, you know, the preparedness, the study, the visualization, but then being present enough because you have the knowing I've prepared. I know what I, I know what my options are and how I can respond. So you can be more alert and aware to the environment to be able to make those critical decisions, even when it's maybe quicker than normal or in an extreme environment. Absolutely. I love that quote. <laughs> it's one of my oh, favorites. Yeah. Seneca, I mean, I, I love stoicism. It really, you know, as you're talking about preparedness the other day, the the little lesson that I had was you know, we focus on the big things, right? Like career transition, death, birth, I lost my job, um, you know, gotten this huge fight, overcame it, went through divorce, whatever it might be. But it's actually how you handle those small petty moments, right? The the person that cuts you off in traffic or, um, you know, the person that you're training that made a mistake, even though you might have explained it very thoroughly because they're brand new and they really just need practice at it, right? All those little moments. And uh, that was a, a great reminder for me to read, you know, because sometimes we forget that and we we kind of gloss over or skate or we don't pay attention. And, and the paying attention is uh, where we can get the most benefit and value. And people are watching those little moments. Like as a leader, people see those things. Um, mm -hmm. I see it with my kids. Uh, they see the little moments, you know, they're watching and they notice the little <laughs> moments and uh, the little moments over time can become big moments. So yeah, I agree. Those little moments do make a difference. When you mention kids and the phrase they're watching, have you, have you watched <laughs> Monsters, Inc.? Yes, I have seen that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking of of Roz, the 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 like little lady. She's like always watching, you know, <laughs> that scene in particular. Um, so for those of you who have not seen Monsters Inc., I, I encourage you. It's a great movie. There's a lot of lessons in there as well that uh, you might be able to get from our conversation today. Um, so I want to segue into, you know, you know, personal life, professional life. You know, kids, our family, the way we interact with them, and then we are leaders and, and we play different roles, right? When, when you were uh, um, an air force pilot and you were leading a team, that role is different than the role when you come home to be a partner or a spouse or, or a mother. Right. And yet you're still, you, you're, you're still the same person. So because of that, we sometimes have goals that are very conflicting and we then feel guilt or, um, passion or excitement or fear, you know, in one space. But then when we start to think about the other, it's the opposite. So can you, talk, can you talk to me a little bit about how you've experienced that in your career? Yeah, I, you know, I, I have played different roles. And, um, and what I've realized over time is like, it's okay for those roles to intersect. I, I think starting out as a young leader, I really wanted to kind of like separate them and put them in nice little bins. Um, and, <laughs> The reality is, is like, that doesn't make you very human. It makes you a little bit more robotic. 
Yeah. And I recognize that when I could talk to my team, my young airmen about being a mom or sometimes the struggles that I had or whatever was going on in my life, like that actually created connection for me. Mm. Um, and they saw me more as a human than this just like, you know, fighter pilot, you know, combat proven. And I walk into a unit and, you know, now I'm the leader. And, you know, at first I felt a little bit more rigid because I'm trying to, you know, put myself in these nice little boxes. Right. And I think I just realized over time that that wasn't very effective. That wasn't really what brought connection with my team. And I, I have realized over time that the more I connect on that very human level, the more I actually allow some of those things to intersect yeah. um, and share and be open, the better I was at all of them. You know, I was just, yeah. it, I feel like, you know, being a better parent made me a better leader. You know, just yes. there's a lot of intersections. And I think people actually want like that authentic human leader versus, you know, someone that just doesn't really have any personal connection. Um, have I always done it well? No. Like I feel like there are times where I really struggled to, you know, do it all. Um, right. And I, you know, I think back to times where my husband deployed, my husband was an A-10 pilot as well. And he deployed for a year and I just was really struggling trying to do all of these things. And I realized yeah. that like, it's actually okay to ask for help. <laughs> you don't have to do it all on your own. Oh, yeah. um, I still work <laughs> at that, but I, you know, trying to play all of those roles, sometimes you just can't do it all very well. No. And that's when it's time to ask for help. So it has been a struggle throughout my career. It's been, I've worked really hard at it, but I actually feel like I've gotten to a point where when I'm more comfortable with myself, I'm, you know, I am okay that I can say I can't do that because my kids have soccer practice. Right. You know, as, whereas before I worried like, well, does that make me look weak because right. I am a mom and I, I'm, can't actually stay two hours late. You know, just, I am more confident and comfortable in who I am, but I also recognize that it almost gives your team permission to like be more yeah. human and to acknowledge, you know, the struggles that they have in their life when you share a little bit of yours. Yeah. I love that. The giving permission, because as with children, they will not do what you say, they will do what you do. Right. And they will emulate that behavior. So you might be saying, Hey, you know, um, leave early, don't reply to emails on the weekends, make sure you go for that health check. And meanwhile, you know, you're working late, you're working on the weekends, you know, you're, you're talking about your health declining, but not doing anything about it. They're going to get a different message. Right. And so yeah. giving that permission is so powerful. Um, and particularly being a woman in a male dominated industry, right. We have, uh, that we've had this narrative of competition with other females and we have to be a man in a man's world, right? We have to kind of be on the same level. But being on the same level doesn't mean we have to be a man. Doesn't mean we have to do it exactly the same way. And there's benefits in, in being in the feminine versus the masculine and that the energy interplays the interconnectedness between that. And so I've, I've finding as I talk to more and more females who have been in the military, who have been in aviation aerospace or male dominated fields, there is now a, a wonderful trend. I'm very happy to see it where women are stepping into that. It's okay to not have it all or do it all. You know, and I, I saw, I forget who it was now, but it was like a very prominent female leader who got asked this question, like, how do you do it all? And she was like, I don't, and I don't want it all. And neither should you. Cause man, that's a lot of work. <laughs> Why would you want to do all of those things? And I think we, for a long time, have this thought that we needed to do it all. And now we're accepting that it's okay to not even want to do it all, even if someone else is telling us that we should. Because the shoulds is where it gets us, right? The shoulds are, are other people's expectations and dreams for us, not, not our own. Yeah. And I... Um... I realized like early on, I put so much pressure on myself. I mean, I mm. just being one of the only women in my fighter squadron and just, I put a lot of pressure on myself to really like be the best at what I was doing. I was afraid of making mistakes. I was afraid of failing. You know, I felt like I would ruin it for the women that followed me. And I just very much, you know, kind of stuck to kind of just being this in this, um, I don't know, I guess maybe the best way to say it is like one of the guys and just really trying to fit in. And, you know, and in reality, the guys, they they knew me, they knew me from my time at the Air Force Academy. And I really just over time became more comfortable in who I was and just being credible and competent. 
yeah. and capable in the airplane. And then I felt more comfortable being myself, but it was a process. Like I, you yeah. know, it's something that I've learned over time. It was not easy starting out. And I, you know, it, I've struggled with it, but I think now, like you said, like there is more support. There are more networks out there. There are groups of people. And I saw a question in the chat about yeah. if you don't have somebody to help you. Like, what do you do in that case? And I think sometimes in our organizations, we may not feel that connection immediately with our immediate team or somebody there that can help. But there are a lot of like external groups where people right. will be vulnerable and open and share those things. And I, I was hesitant to join those groups when I first started out. And I'm so grateful that I did over time because I realized that many of those, in this case, women were going through many of the same things that I was. They had a lot of the same questions. Someone had been there and done it or had thought about it or had experience in it. And as soon as I allowed myself to open up and join some of those groups and have some of those conversations, I really felt that support mm -hmm. um, from an external group, from people that I didn't actually know, but right. we'd gotten to know each other. And so I think yeah. Part of that is being a little bit vulnerable and reaching out and finding those groups and people to provide that support network. I love that. Yeah, I, I believe it was um, last week with Eric, he talked about this like invisible wall that we have built up around us because we think we need to do it all on our own. And that, you know, you think there's nobody there when you're looking. And he said, but if you if you put your hand out, it's going to go through the fog and you're going to find there's like 100 hands outstretched that you could reach out to. But if you always keep your hands to yourself, you'll never feel feel them or notice them or be aware. And so I like that you know you, you mentioned going to external groups, and sometimes it can be hard. You know you have to you have to go to a few different ones. You may not resonate yeah. with the first group um, that you start to connect with, um, but the more you do it, the easier you get to know you know you know yourself more. Yeah, you go, okay, that didn't work for me. That was too much of this or not enough of that or, you know, lovely people, but eh, just it's not doing it for me. Okay, let me try to go over here. And whether that's an all women's group or uh, an intermixed or it's about around a hobby or a skill, uh, there are so many things you can explore, so many different avenues. And, and then you might even surprise yourself. You might find yourself in a, you know, like gardening club. And that was never on your radar before, but you really resonate with these people and it, it gives you something that you never experienced. And so it can be quite fun to try those new things also. Yeah. And I, have all, I think one of the things I realized is that sometimes people want to help, but they don't know how. Right. And I realized when my husband deployed, I, I was just struggling with like life in general, like the lawn wasn't mowed. I mean, these are minor things, right? Little things, but right. I, I was also struggling like schedules and kids and feeding them. And as soon as somebody was like, Hey, we actually want to help, you know, like neighbors that I didn't really know. Um, and I was like, okay, yes, I would love for you to mow my lawn. Yes. You know, what would really help me is if you would bring a meal. Like I finally right. just found my voice of like, it is okay to say, I can't actually get all this together. You know, can you help? Yeah. And so it's just letting people know what you need. I think, you know, that's a lot of um, what Eric was talking about is if you actually reach out, you know, yeah. as opposed to being afraid to ask for help and admitting that right. you can't do it yourself. And, and even just spending the time with yourself to know what to ask for, right? Because yeah. you said in the beginning, you didn't really know, or even maybe you didn't conceive that that was something you could actually ask for help and receive support with from a different role or person, you know, in, in your world. And it's not always going to be clear right off the bat. You know, it might take some reflection, some time and, recognizing what you need first. And when you realize, okay, I can't do this for myself right now. Where can I, where can I get it? Where can that support come from? And getting very clear. And sometimes those, those things might seem like, oh no, no, I don't want to need that. Right. Cause we want to portray or express something and, you know, be impressive. Right. A lot of times as we grow up in leadership, all of a sudden we feel like we have to impress everybody. I have to prove that I belong here. And so we do certain things and think that we can no longer have the help or have the support. And so um, what would you say to people who might be having that thought? Start small. <laughs> Coming from somebody that um, has struggled with asking for help, uh, you know, asking <laughs> yeah. somebody to mow the lawn is a lot different than asking them to watch your kids for four hours. Right. Um, you know, starting with those just small things or, you know, 
reaching out to people and just starting small to help you get comfortable with asking for help. Um, and then, you know, then you can open up a little bit more and, and you know, recognize that people are willing to help and then you can ask for the bigger things. Yes, I love that. Starting small is always the best way. Just like we men you mentioned before, you don't need a, a super long huddle, just five minutes, right? Yep. Connecting in and, and having that ability to test and make sure, right? You know, it's I, it's kind of like when you go for the, the sample at the store, do I actually like this food before I buy it? And then you've tasted it and you're like, that was delicious. Yes, let me get it. Or you're like, nope. I hated that. I'm not going to buy that particular product. And sometimes it's important to just have the small victories, like those small wins, like to give us a little bit of confidence, confidence and courage to move forward with the bigger things. Yes. How do you celebrate your wins? It's a good question. Um, I think for me, like, especially now when I'm on the road and I've, you know, did a speech and I come home, like, I actually, I think, my celebration now is not much. It's like a day of rest, like mm. uh, like a, a hike and a recoup and a lunch yeah. with my husband and just like put everything else aside and give myself like um, a little break, like a little bit of a, a down day, you know, even yeah. if it's in the middle of the week, like I just give myself some rest and like acknowledge what I just did and how busy it was. And just, it gives me a chance to kind of recoup too. Um, and recharge. So I would say that's really the thing that I, I love to hike. It's, I live in Colorado and it's so nice yeah. to get out in the mountains and it just, I feel like it recharges me. So um, I think that's probably the way that I, that's, you know, looking back over the past year, those are, that's usually what I do is I'll take a day and just decompress. That's beautiful. And recognizing that, you know, again, you don't have to do it all. You don't have to do it all right now and giving yeah. yourself that space to process what just happened and, you know, I'm sure in that lunch with your husband and the hikes, you have conversation and it helps tease out things that you might not be able to recognize or acknowledge if you just went straight back into the grind. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. I love it. I'm, a lot of my guests recently have been in, based in Colorado or, or love the mountains of Colorado as like their key place. And so I think there's something special about that thin mountain air, right? When you're at high altitude and it's fresh and it's crisp and it's clean. It's yes, almost yes. like it helps also clear away all the garbage that we pick up in our day-to-day -day lives and allows us to really like come back home to ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, that's what I love about <laughs> that's what I love about hiking and getting out in the mountains is just refreshing yeah. and recharging. And I, I it's a, a great way for me to also just relax. And and you know, that's also great for anyone who's listening. You may not live in Colorado or have mountains nearby, but getting outside, right? Just moving your body, getting that fresh air, feeling the wind on your skin, that can be really powerful as well. So I'm laughing, Kim, laughing at the comment that says it makes me dizzy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I um one of the one of the women I met, well, I, I didn't meet her, but I um, saw her last week, and she is an aerobatics pilot. And I was like, can we go the next time I'm in Chicago? She's like, well, my plane's in maintenance, but yes. So Julia Harrington was telling me all about it. And somebody's like, you want to do that? I get sick every time. I was like, oh, I'm I'm like a kid in a candy store. I'll just be giggling the whole time like a little maniac. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I will also get the nausea later. Like once we level out, my body catches up to what's, or my mind catches up to what's happened. My body's like, what? <laughs> what did you just do to me, right? Um, but that again is that, facing something that might be a bit scary and doing it anyways, and then being able to get your own reflections and lessons from that. So. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have a question here. How do you help someone who looks at the pessimism in life? So if, if you might encounter somebody who's constantly looking at those things that went wrong or yeah. um, not, not sure how to make that pivot. Yeah. I think it's interesting because I'm an optimist. So I tend to look at like, I, I have the different perspective on that. Um, but I recently had a conversation with my son because he's a little bit more of a pessimist. Like he is, and I finally was like, it, you know, it's hard for me because it's such an opposite viewpoint. And then I finally said like, why are you so negative? Like what, why are you so down and pessimistic about everything? And he was like, mom, if I'm negative about it and then I do well on this test, then I feel really good. But if I'm optimistic, like I did really well, then I feel let down. And I was like, 
Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, that that's a different way of looking about it, at it. So, you know, I understand the expectation. Yeah. And, and it, that's just, that's the way he works. Yeah. Um, and so I, I get it. People look at things a little bit different ways. Um, and I've really tried, you know, I, because I am an optimist and I think it is important to have that positive mindset, but I am also, I guess, maybe more of a realist. And then I also look at like what could go wrong, the potholes yeah. down the road. So I think it's a just ideally letting someone see both sides, like the benefits of being more optimistic and having a positive mindset while also acknowledging that that may not be how they're wired. And that's yeah. kind of where I'm in with my son right now. Like yeah. I'm, I try to have him have this positive mindset and think positively, but I also recognize that his comfort level right now is being a little bit more pessimistic about things. Yeah. And you know what, I think what you, what you just said too, is so important for people to remember it's okay to be that way. You don't have to be common optimist. It's more a matter of what's the other perspective that you can offer yourself and, you know, just trying it on for size, not, not changing your personality or making it wrong. Right. Because there's, we all have different preferences. We all experience reality in very different ways and everything, as you said, has a limit and a serve. So there's, there's a way that this mindset can help you and there's a way it can also limit you, right? If you're overly optimistic and you neglect planning for anything that could go wrong, if it goes well, wonderful. But if it doesn't, you might be, you know, up the creek without a paddle. And so there's, there's always going to be more than one perspective and one way to solve a problem. That's so true. And, and I see that with my kids, like, they do things in a different way. And I just have to, I acknowledge that I, I try to share a little bit of, you know, maybe seeing a little bit of the other side, but I also am trying to meet them where they're at. Yes. I love that meeting them where they're at. And I think that is beautiful advice for leadership, for parents, for relationships. You know, when you, when you are aiming to fix or change someone because you have experienced, you know, it's, what is it? It's like, I've drank the Kool-Aid is so great. I'm going to tell you about it. <laughs> right? Like I used to do CrossFit. So, I mean, I, I understand this <laughs> from that perspective. Um, and, you know, you want to tell everybody about all the benefits that you're having in this, but if people are not there, they're, they don't, they don't want to hear it. Right. And so accepting that that's what they're going to do. And that's how they have chosen giving them the respect and of sovereignty of choice, that that is what they are choosing. And that's okay. It doesn't have to be the same choice that you've made. I think we would find whether you're Democrat or Republican or you're, you know, one nationality or another, we would have a lot more connection points rather than contention points. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. So I'm another thing I like to tell people when they ask me this, that kind of question is, you know, glass half empty or half full. I think most people, I'm very similar to you. I'm a very positive person, uh, but also with the realism in there. But one of, one of my mentors who shared with me, we actually have a group chat about with this, like, in the title and it's, it doesn't matter if it's half empty or half full because it's refillable. And when he told me that in 2020, it literally like shattered this perception that I had. And I was like, you know what? That's so true. Like, I don't even have to drink the same drink. I can put something <laughs> else in that, in that glass. And I started going into all these possibilities. Uh, and again, it's, it's just a different perspective. I love it. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. So stress, a lot of people avoid stress, right? They, they don't like conflict. They don't want to do hard things because it, it's, it hurts. It's not comfortable. I mean, going to the gym isn't always fun. It's like second tier fun, right? It's it, you're struggling, but in that struggle, you are getting endorphins. You're feeling good. You're getting stronger. So there's a benefit at the same time, right? We, we do that for a specific reason. So how have you been able to use the stress that you've experienced in your life to help you not only grow from it, but build that resilience? Do you have some practical takeaways that you, you implement kind of day to day when stressful moments happen? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, I've realized, um, you know, I've lived pretty much a life of a more high stress environment uh, at times yeah. being an A-ton pilot. But I also realize that stress has been a good thing in, in some ways. And I, there is a limit, right? You know, we have to be cautious about putting too much stress and pressure on ourselves. But I think stress um, 
can be a good thing because for me, when I feel stressed, I go back, I fall back to the preparation. You know, mm. it's that when I start feeling the stress, I start feeling the worry. It's an, it's an immediate, like, okay, why am I feeling stressed right now? Right. Let me go back, acknowledge it. It's the same thing with fear. I'm going to acknowledge it. And then I'm going to go back to really digging in a little bit on it um, mm. and really preparing for it and putting in the work and just being ready for whatever it is that's about to come. I think sometimes when we put ourselves in stressful situations and push ourselves outside our comfort zone, um, it allows us to grow. And I think that sometimes it's just shifting the mindset of what that stress is for. Like when we're feeling stressed, it's probably because we're a little bit out of our element. You know, it's something new, it's something different. And so it's a mindset shift of, okay, you know, this may be a little bit uncomfortable, but you know, if it's going to the gym, uh, maybe I'll feel better tomorrow, or maybe it's 48 hours, you know, uh, after <laughs> the thornness is gone, but, but I will be better for it. And I think it's just a little bit for me is reminding myself, like what's on the other side of that, push myself through that stress by doing the work, putting in the preparation and then thinking about like, okay, well, you know, why am I stressed and how am I going to feel about this, you know, tomorrow yeah. once it's done. And generally the answer is I'm going to feel pretty, um, good uh, about it and that I accomplished something and I did something hard. Yes. I love that. You can do hard things. I think we all, we all can, we are very resilient and that reflection or that, excuse me, connection to how you'll feel on the other side. That's where the values come in that you mentioned before, right? Because if you're not tied to that, it's very easy to give up or to, oh, it's too hard. I don't want to do that. And that's the key phrase. I don't want to do that. So a lot of people want the outcome. They want a result, but they're not willing to do what it takes to get there because it's uncomfortable. But that is where we get the growth that allows us to achieve that result. And you said, you know, at the gym, you know, start small, right? To your earlier point, if you go in the gym and you try to lift a hundred kilos right away, like probably going to hurt yourself if you can even get it off the ground, <laughs> Right. But if you start smaller and then you build that weight, even if it's only, I remember my coach used to, there'd be these like quarter kilo plates and I'd be like, mm, you know, I want to jump up five kilos. This is such a baby thing. And at first my ego got the best of me, but you know, and I couldn't make those jumps, but then I started to just put in the little quarter plates. Then it was a half plate. Then it was a whole kilo. And the next thing you knew, I wasn't hurting myself and I was actually growing in weight, but it was so small. It almost felt insignificant, but it, it built over time to something quite big. Yeah. I, I, as you're talking, I'm like, I need to have my kids listen to this episode and really <laughs> uh, dig into some of this. It's, it's so true. And it's so applicable to leadership and parenting. And I think as leaders, wherever you are in your life, you do have a responsibility to help the people on your team or your yeah. children, uh, you know, just to give them those opportunities to push themselves push themselves outside their comfort zone, you know, whether it's a, a new opportunity or, you know, maybe they're leading that presentation or for your kids, like, what is it that you can encourage them to do that might feel hard and might feel stressful? And can they do take it in small chunks? And how will they feel on the other side? Generally mm -hmm. pretty accomplished, like they've learned yeah. something. Um, and I think that's important to remember as well, that I think leaders have that responsibility to create those opportunities to develop and grow. Absolutely. Yes. I love that you brought that up because sometimes it's frustrating. It's taking a long time. And so you just want to do it yourself so that you can get it done and you know, it's, it's good, but that's where the bottleneck comes in and you're not allowing that person to step into the potential. And then they see that you've just done it. So now they're reliant on you. Right. And so they, they don't feel empowered to be able to do those things. Same thing with, with your children, um, I remember very clearly one of my coaches, I was experiencing a situation with one of my clients and I wasn't sure how to handle it. And I immediately went to him and asked him how, and I found, I found out later now, cause I actually work with him. He said, if someone asked me a how question, I never answer the how, because that's not what's really going on. But he didn't respond to my message. And about two hours in, I was like, I don't think he's going to reply to me, but I tried, <laughs> I tried again. And I was like, oh, I have to get back to this. I have to get back to this person. Like, I can't just wait around all day. And then I made a decision and I did it and I learned from it. And then he and I were able to reflect on it. And he's like, when did you realize I wasn't going to reply? So actually, as I was texting you, I thought you might not reply, but I was <laughs> hoping that you would, <laughs> you know, 
Um, but he had to create that opportunity and hold the space and be uncomfortable knowing that I was on the other end having some intense emotion and trust that I would be able to pull my resources together and come up with a solution. Was it the best solution? Maybe not, but it was the best solution that I could have come up with. And because it was my decision, my choice, then the lesson really sunk. If he would have told me what to do, I would have just kept repeating that and never evolved it or grown it or felt confident that I could have really do it without him, right? So he had to, I'm sure as a parent, you've done that many times, right? And you just watch from a distance and you can see they're about to do something, but you let them do it so that they can learn from it. And sometimes like it's hard to let go. And I think sometimes we see with leaders, like they want control. They're just, it's hard because it's, it will take more time or it just feels uncomfortable to let go. But it, it's a little bit of a reminder from the leadership perspective of like, when you do let go and you empower your team to make those decisions and make sure they have the resources and the training, obviously to do that. But you now can take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Like you can now look up from the weeds and focus on that bigger picture. And so there are, there are benefits on both sides when you're allowing people to develop and grow, but from a team organization perspective, now you're really empowering your team to do the things that they should be doing. And now you can take that more strategic viewpoint. Yes. I love that. We're zooming out to get that yes. top down view, right. And, and getting a better perspective. And sometimes that's all we need to do. Right. And that's what going outside offers as well. That's what um, doing something in a new way offers. And that that's a responsibility that we have as leaders, whether or not you have a manager title or not. I think people forget that they can be a leader. Yes. No matter where you are. Right. Be, because if you've ever influenced the guy from Shark Tank, Damon John was one of the keynotes at, at base. And he went through this whole thing and he said, you know, if you've ever negotiated who gets to use the one bathroom in the house when you're on vacation <laughs> before you go outside, or if you've ever had a presentation or if you've ever made, been the decision maker of lunch in your group of friends, you have led people and you have successfully sold a pitch. And I was like, that is such an excellent reframe because we are literally doing it all day long. And then yet when it comes for the formal time, for some reason we get tripped up. So if we can remember this is actually just how we communicate and how we interact. It doesn't become so scary. Yeah, it's such a it's such a good way of looking at it, you know. And I think you don't need a title to be a leader. Is really what it comes down to. Like, yeah. you, you can be a leader at any stage of your life. And sometimes people think there has to be a title, and that really it. Sometimes the title you can have a title and not be a leader. So yes. uh, that's probably Very true. <laughs> that is probably the more important thing is that like you you uh, you have to step into that role with or right. without a title. Yes. And does anyone has, have you ever gotten a business card that has leader in it? I, I've never gotten one. I always see manager or director or whatever fancy title. You know, Imagineer. If you're at Disney and you're an engineer. Um, but I've never seen the actual word leader because that's not the the designation of the role. And so you you don't need that in order to be a leader. And, and most certainly I have met people with those titles that are not effective in the way that they lead people. They're managing people as if it was a project and the skill set to manage a thing or a process is very different to managing people because people are emotions. In, in walking form, right? So we have to handle and navigate and communicate and understand those things in order to connect. Very true. So what would you say your superpower is, Kim? <laughs> I knew this question was coming. Um, <laughs> and I, I had to think about it. And I actually asked, I asked my husband what he thought my superpower was, because I was kind of like, do, I wonder, like, sometimes you wonder, like, do you think your superpower is the same that somebody yeah. else thinks it, it was is? a reflection. Yeah. And um, we came up pretty close, but we came up with different words. And so I thought that was interesting, but yeah. really what it comes down to, and I'm still not sure this is like the correct word for a superpower. And then I hesitate because superpower in my mind, like, I think it's something you have, it's something that come e comes easy. But for me, my superpower, if I were to like title, it would be, it's this idea of balance, but mm. it hasn't come easy. And I've had to work really hard at it. Uh, and I haven't always done it well. It's something that I think over time, and by balance, I mean a couple of things. One is this, you know, 
trying to figure out how to be a mom, mm. how to be a leader, how to be a fighter pilot, how to be a wife, like how to do all of these things and how to have some balance in that over time, right? I recognize that I am not going to have that balance every day. It's not going to be this perfect 50 50. It's, you know, some days I'm going to be a really good leader because I'm very focused on what I'm doing, but that may mean I have to stay late. And then I feel like I'm not a very good mom. And so it's just okay. over time, how do I find that long term balance? The other way I look at this, and this was more of what I was focusing on, is this idea of balance of being a strong, credible, leader while mm. also being a caring and compassionate leader and finding mm. that right balance. Because I find like, if you have too much of one, it doesn't really work out very well. And so for me, I, over the course of my career, again, I haven't always done this well. And so I hesitate with the word superpower. Like I've really put in a lot of work to try yeah. to find that balance of what that looks like. Um, so that's a very complicated answer to your question, but um, I, it's one of these ones I've just been reflecting on and thinking on. Yeah. Well, and that's why that's what it's designed to do. And I love that you brought up that perspective of a superpower being something that's inherent and natural versus something that you work at, because we all have different definitions and perspectives on words that we assume everybody else has the same definition. And, you know, you could think of it almost like you know, a lot of people are like, oh, the X-Men, right? They have these inherent kind of supernatural abilities and they're, they're born with them. Um, but then you also have some superpowers that are developed because, you know, they fell into a vat of chemicals or they, <laughs> you know, got hit by lightning or whatever. Um, and, and at the same time, we see character development of these, these people and their super, their, their application of the superpower or the way that they um, handle this responsibility evolves over time. And so I think that's a really great perspective to offer everyone when they reflect on this question is it doesn't have to be something you were born with. It can be something that you built intentionally and now it is a strength. Whereas before it was not something that just came very naturally. And while I think we all have natural skills and abilities, it is what we practice that becomes the superpower versus yeah. what we just, oh well, yeah, I'm good at it. So I'll always be good at it. Yeah, no, it's, it's required a lot of work. And, um, you know, I, there are moments where I still struggle with it, but I still yeah. think it's one of the things that I've focused on most because I really want to be a good mom. I want to be a good leader. I want to be a good wife. You know, I, I want to do all of these things, recognizing that I can't always have it all, all the time. Right. And so how do I find that balance or integration or equilibrium? I think there's so many words that you can use, um, for it. I, I'm not sure I'm, found the right one yet for that superpower title, but I'm yeah. working on it. That's okay. I love the word yet, you know, yeah. uh, because it's, it's very powerful when a lot of people say, oh, I'm not this, I'm not that. But when you add yet, it opens the door of possibility. Right. Um, and I was on the, I was on the plane with a group of people and this gentleman, he's like, I forgot what, do, what is it that you fly? And he was like naming off some aircraft. And I said, well, I don't fly any of those yet. And then Mace was like, she's going to go to space. I was like, I'm going to fly a starship. <laughs> I, <was laughs> I like, love it. All right. And so, you know, the, adding the yet, it even feels good to say it, you know? Um, so whatever you're thinking out there that uh, I don't have a superpower, add the word yet at the end, because that's going to open the door where you can start to think about what you can develop if you feel like you maybe don't have one just yet. So that was a really great perspective uh, reframe. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I, I was just thinking that word yet, like it, it means intentionality, right? Like, yes. yeah, yeah. not Absolutely. yet, but I have intention to do it. Exactly. Yes. And so with that, um, with your answer to the first question, I feel like I um, can safely assume that your partner, your husband is uh, on your board of directors, your personal board of directors, who else would you say is, is part of that board? You know, that, that, that lens that you would look through life at something and help to make decisions and offer new perspectives? Yeah, I think um, definitely my husband, he has been, you know, my partner, my wingman, uh, he, you know, we've had very similar career paths. And so we've been able to bounce ideas off of each other, 
you know, and he also knows some of the, my shortcomings and, and where he can bounce me out with that. So yeah. he is definitely on my board. Um, my parents actually, my, you know, my dad, uh, very logical, very straightforward, my mom, you know, compassionate, that human side. And so I love having people on my board that ha that can provide that different perspective and a different look at things. Uh, my brother, because <laughs> he is not afraid to tell me what he thinks. Uh, <laughs> he is eight years younger than me. And he, um, he will tell me straight up. And I love that. Like it is, you always want somebody on your board or on your team that is not afraid to give you the honest truth and to, right. to tell you, maybe where you need to to work on some things. And so I yeah. love that from him. And he does it in a very loving and kind way. Yes. Um, or at least follows up with a very loving and kind statement. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I would say I have I have a functional board as well. Like if I'm working on a, you know, when I was working on the book and you know still am, you know, I have people in that space that I feel very comfortable reaching out to and just asking some questions that, you know, uh, that I'm struggling with. Or if I'm in the speaker realm, like who are those speakers? I have, you know, yeah. I have people that I go to for different functions in my life. Right. Um, and I think that's important is to find those experts and seek them out and have those people that you feel comfortable really asking some of those questions that you don't feel like you could ask in a larger audience. Um, yeah. But I, I'm grateful for all, all of those people and for being willing to provide their perspective and, and mentorship and guidance and direction over the years for sure. I love that. And I, I really appreciate your use of the term functional board because who you might go to for a speaking mentorship or question or guidance may not be the same person that you go to for a very uh, a, a different functional task or even a personal situation, right? Just due to the nature of whatever that is. And that's okay, right? It's not the uh, end all be all. This person has all the answers. It's simply a new perspective, and um, sometimes you don't even need to actually go to that person, right? It's okay. just, well, what would what would they do if I were to have a conversation with them? You know, uh, what would what would my mom say? It, you know, maybe you can't get a hold of her. You know, yeah. maybe she's on a, a plane or she's sleeping. You're in a different time zone, but it'll invite you to consider new perspectives because you're looking at it of how do I think they would respond? And so that's why I love this particular practice and check, kind of checking in because it can help you navigate some of those tricky situations without completely giving away your agency and going, oh, I have to talk to this person first, right? Yeah. And that actually goes back to a question that somebody asked if you don't have people, you know, that you can count on that you can ask for help yeah. for. Sometimes if you just have um, that board of people that, you know, that you look up to or that you, you know, believe in them for something that they stand for. And you can kind of look at it through that lens. Right. Um, I think sometimes that helps because there are people out there who have, you know, experienced things and done things and you kind of think, okay, what would they do in this moment? Right. Or how would they handle this right now? And sometimes that's enough just to get us through that moment. Absolutely. I love that you tied circled back on that. You know, I've, I've heard, People say, you know, well, I don't know this person. They're, you know, very famous. And I really resonate with their story and the way that they approach things. And so I often will turn to that perspective. And so that's a beautiful way to have the ability to do that, even if maybe in your immediate sphere, there's not anyone that you would go to. Yeah, very true. So with the final question, um, thinking about your superpower and all of the things we've spoken about today, how would you say that you best serve or represent humanity? Such a big question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, and I did think about this a little bit. I think it kind of ties in with everything that we've talked about. And it is this idea that when we have the courage to be vulnerable and to mm -hmm. share the stories, to share the experiences, even if they don't like always highlight the good or the, the success, when we're willing to share those things with people, when it's the failures or the mistakes or the things that we didn't do well, I think that has the ability to help others. And, and so that's what I'm coming into my, uh, coming into my own courage of like being able to do that now. And I, like I said, I, I struggle with it, whether it's a, a LinkedIn post or publishing the book or, you know, sharing that story in a speech, sometimes it does feel very vulnerable and, and I get nervous about it. And I just remind myself that like by sharing stories, by sharing experiences that you can help others. And so that that's really what my intention is now and what I, what I hope that I'm doing for people. 
Beautiful. I really love that. Thank you so much, Kim. This has been so much fun. I feel like we could continue talking the rest yeah. of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll likely have to get you on the show again for, for another conversation, but it's been, it's been a blast. And I would like to ask you if people want to reach out to you, what's the best place that they can learn more about who you are and what you do and, and connect? Yeah, absolutely. I um, My website, which is kim-casey-campbell.com has links to all the social media, links to my email. And I I really, I see lots of people from different places um, that are in the chat. And I just, I would say that like, I would love for you to reach out if there is a question that we didn't, you know, something that we didn't cover or something that you wanted to know more about, um, please feel free to reach out on any of my social media channels um, or through email, whatever works best for you. Um, but I, I do appreciate that, that connection, um, and hearing from people. So yeah, definitely reach out. Thank you so much. And yes, everyone, um, the, on each platform in the podcast description, you can find all of the links for Kim, her website, her social media channels, and we love to get feedback, right? We, we love to reiterate and reflect and, and figure out, Again, what did you like about this podcast? What did you really enjoy? And what were you like, man, maybe I, I didn't need to hear that or maybe this format, et cetera. So I would love to learn as well what you're loving about the lounge and what you would like to see if you haven't seen it yet. So thank you, Kim, again, for offering more perspectives for me to, to improve this experience for my speakers, for the audience as well. And we will um, follow up with everybody soon. For those of you who regularly watch The Lounge, there will be a couple weeks break. I will be traveling the next few weeks, and I have decided to also give myself that pause, that permission to rest and reflect, and you can expect to see us back online live in mid-November. Thank you so much. Have a great day, and we will see you very soon. Thanks, everyone.